Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode seven of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike. That is Gavin. How's it going, Gavin? I'm doing swell, Mike. I am now officially, I mean, to, to our listeners, I've been back in South Dakota for like two weeks now, but this is the first episode that we're actually recording with me back in South Dakota. So fun times. Uh, and it also happens to be when, when y'all hear it, Inauguration Day. Yes, and so we uh, we had specifically picked out this episode. I we asked Gavin, or I asked Gavin. I was like, you know, what's a good political episode we could do for inauguration day? What's some like real controversial stuff? And uh, the answer I got was Pleistocene rewilding, which is just the the hard hitting political analysis that I know you all come <laughs> here for. Um, so in in reality, I was like, okay, I I don't know enough about like obviously being a you know, I have a degree in geology and biology. So like, I know more than the average bear about climate change, but I would want to, like, if we're going to do an episode about climate change, I'm going to want to give that like a couple of weeks worth of research because that's just how important that is to me. Uh, and I just, when we decided to do something vaguely political uh, for inauguration day, that's, I, we didn't have the time for me to do that. So this is like climate change adjacent. So this is sort of what we settled on. It's climate change adjacent. It is politically adjacent. It is perfect for January 20th. And according to the 20th Amendment, January 20th is when the new president shall take office. And so do we have a uh, kind of January 20th in history, if this is going to be our new thing for our intros? What's, uh, what important science thing has happened in January 20th in history? All right. So once again, if you did not listen to last episode, uh, my mom got me like a desktop calendar uh, for like a this day in science. So on January 20th, 2017, uh, the title is Smart Needle Improves Brain Surgery Odds. Interesting. It says Smart Needle? Smart Needle. Yeah, that's what it says. But let's see. Researchers from the universities of Adelaide and Western Australia and the Sir Charles Gairdner Hospital announced their creation of a quote-unquote smart needle, a surgical instrument that is the diameter of a human hair, equipped with fiber optic cameras, wow, and an infrared light source. Developers say this tool allows surgeons to detect and effectively circumnavigate at-risk blood vessels that may potentially rupture, causing the brain bleeds that surgeons work so hard to minimize. Experts set the invention up for clinical trials, Hoping full commercialization of the needle will follow soon. You know, there are there are some things that living through now just seem like magic or witchcraft. And like surgery itself seems like borderline witchcraft. But the fact that <laughs> there was that kind of advancement that we're putting cameras and infrared whatever on needles, the width of a human hair, like that's, you would get burned at the stake for that, you know, not too long ago. <laughs> And the kind of the time scale that we talk about on this podcast. Well, that's just so crazy because it's like, uh, you know, I've dabbled a bit with like a little bit of photography, a little bit of like video editing. Um, and the fact that they can put a camera like and I'm sure if it's like in somebody's brain, it's probably a pretty good like resolution camera. But the fact that they can put a camera at all on something that small blows my mind. It it blows my mind. It just it's it's amazing the kind of things that get done that like you don't go to buy at a store because Apple just released it on their new iPhone. But just the, <laughs> the 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 I would say slow progress, but more the unheard progress of all the different things that happen to just make our lives a little bit better, a little bit at a time is just monumental. Absolutely, like. That, that's an area where I wish that I did know more about, especially these days, is like the medical field. Just because everybody that I know is like, oh, hey, you're a scientist. What's with up, what's up with all this vaccine stuff? Like, what what's with the new one? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like, not, you, not your area of expertise? No, I'm like, once again, like, I probably know more than like your average person. But that doesn't, like, I'm not the person to ask, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I bet I actually just got my uh, my vaccine yesterday, Woo! which was good. My girlfriend and I, who was also a teacher, we were able to go get our first shot 
And uh, it was about as easy as it could possibly be, which is absolutely wonderful. So you're ready for Bill Gates to know every step that you take, right? Yeah, I got that uh, that Bill Gates microchip all ready to go. Uh, it was delivered to me directly by 5G. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and it you know this is uh you know this is how humanity is destined to progress at this point. We there are uh, there will only be lone survivors at this point. Anyway, let's get into the actual content of the episode. I've had uh, I uh, I hate talking about like even fishy, facetiously. I hate talking about like conspiracy theories and stuff like that. Like they can be fun if you're doing it as like trolling or for the meme, but like. These days, there's just too much of it going around that even, like, it sucks the fun out of it. Before we get started, I do want to just very quickly acknowledge the end of our previous oh, yeah. episode, um, considering we are doing a politics podcast, or pardon me, the, a politics episode, quote-unquote, and this is airing on January 20th, and just what we said at the last podcast. So just for some context, at the end of the last podcast, we were talking about the inauguration of the new president, and Gavin, we were talking about <laughs> what how... How good or how much things would change uh, with the, the inauguration of a new president? And Gavin was talking about he was a little worried. And I said, what's there to be worried about already? And Gavin said something to the effect of, well, I'm not really worried about what's going on at the Capitol. Boy, was I wrong. I'm worried about what uh, – wow. <laughs> so, And it's not funny. It's not – five people it's, died. It's not, it's not funny. It's not funny. But it uh, – so just – well, I put it at the end of last episode, but just for some clarification, we recorded that episode well before the events of January Yeah, we recorded 6th. that like on the 2nd, I think, right? Something like that? Some It was sometime in January, but before the 6th. So I guess there's a five-day window that yeah. we could have recorded it on. Uh, and I just want to say that if our podcast, you know, at that point, six episodes in is already predicting the future, <laughs> maybe we really do, uh, you know, maybe this really is our thing. Oh, God. Okay. With that out of the way, content. So, today, we're going to talk about Pleistocene Rewilding. So, I actually sort of referenced this back in episode three uh, about Jurassic Park when we were sort of talking about de-extincting things, which we'll get a little bit into today. Uh, but once again, uh, as, as we talked about in that episode, not something that I take all that seriously in paleontology, but it is like actually relevant to this conversation. So we will kind of touch on it a little bit. Um, and Mike, you actually might know a little bit about this one because I actually gave a presentation on this topic last semester and Mike, along with some of our other uh, friends that we both volunteer with, uh, they were sort of my guinea pigs to sort of make it understandable. If I remember correctly, this is kind of early, early COVID days when we were, everyone was trapped inside. And when given the option to uh, to listen to a proposal on Pleistocene rewilding, is I believe how you say it, I was like, I'm all in. Like, this is the most exciting thing I've done in months. So uh, that was, I did do a different presentation. That was back in like late April, actually probably like mid-May, realistically, is when I did that one. That was actually for my thesis. This was one that I, a presentation that I gave just at the end of last semester. I'm pretty sure you were on it. Like, yep. Uh, I don't know, maybe mid no no, because my finals week was like the first or second week in November. We, we ended super early. So it's probably like early November, late October. So it's been a couple months. So if you don't remember this, okay. this whole presentation, I basically just went through my, my PowerPoint and copy pasted a bunch of stuff. So hopefully, I, I you do will, remember, uh, remember the, a bit. Uh, I do remember um, at least the like what it is to a lay person. If you were to kind of give the elevator pitch to a lay person, I have a basic idea of what it is we're going to be talking about here. The specifics, I uh, I don't want to disappoint you, Gavin, but most of the specifics <laughs> have kind of left me here. But I will uh, let's toss it to you. So we are talking about Pleistocene rewilding. Um, to you know, to kind of fire the opening salvo here. Uh, what the hell? <laughs> so. Uh... We need to sort of break that down to both of its words, the Pleistocene and, you know, what is the Pleistocene and what is rewilding? So first we'll talk about the Pleistocene. So the Pleistocene is a uh, geologic epic. So we have, I broke down, I believe in episode one, maybe episode two about dinosaurs, how we sort of break up geologic time. So the largest size are eons and then eras, then periods. And then after that comes epics and it's spelled E-P-O-C-H, not E-P-I-C, although it is pronounced the same. 
So this is a relatively small slice of time. And it's also relatively recent. So it went from about two and a half ish million years ago to only about uh, 11,000 years ago. So it's what most people would sort of think of as the ice age. That's sort of what we're talking about here. I was just going to say, so not, not like a crazy, crazy long time ago, but still, you know, you know plenty well far back. I mean, mo- the vast majority of animals that were around at this time are still around. Right, exactly. So, so we, we're not talking about, you know, some completely different world. Right. I mean, you if you were to look outside, it would look very different, particularly where, not where I currently am in western South Dakota, but where you are in uh, in central-ish New York, uh, it'd be very different because there'd be, oh God, uh, I've heard all sorts of different, like at, at like the peak of the glaciers, there would have been like close to a mile of ice above you right now. It can feel that way sometimes here, but yeah, that would be a, uh, that would be kind of a different world. And so that's, that's the Pleistocene. You said it, that was the Pleistocene, was it the epic Pleistocene yes. period? Pleistocene okay. epic. Okay. And what the Pleistocene is, is really, really notable for is the lots and lots of big mammals just cruising around. Things like mammoths, things like saber tooth cats. Things like uh, these giant ground sloths, which are, which are some of my favorite animals ever. I love them. Uh, they're basically just a gigantic, like almost elephant-sized sloth that has basically armor because it has these things called uh, osteoderms, which are little pieces of bone in its skin to make its skin like super, super durable. And so it's just a gigantic elephant-sized bulletproof sloth, and I love them. That sounds like something that it is uh, there to love. Exactly. So that's just sort of the, the time period that we're sort of thinking out or uh, thinking about. So let's let's talk about we'll we'll circle back to the place of scene in a little bit. So let's talk about rewilding and what rewilding actually is. So basically it's the whole concept of uh, I think I have somewhere in the the uh, bullet points here, sort of like uh, from SpongeBob to, to paraphrase from Patrick Starr, we're gonna pick up some animals. And push them somewhere else. Making SpongeBob references on this show should become a uh, a regular thing. But the whole rewilding part, absolutely, and I will <laughs> I will try and help out with that whenever possible. But the the rewilding part of this is definitely what I remember most from your presentation. Mm-hmm. That is, this is kind of the um, what I it is when you were talking about this, just this idea of rewilding and kind of what this is, if I'm remembering correctly, this is what really sticks out in my head. So go ahead. And what is for everybody who doesn't know what is rewilding? Cause it actually isn't all that different from what it sounds like. It's basically trying to return environments and ecosystems to their like pre industrialization or sometimes, you know, depending on who you ask, like pre human, uh, sort of normal, which as we'll talk about in a little bit, normal isn't really like a thing because like, how do you, how would you define normal? Because like the world is always changing, which I know is a really dumb and bad argument, like against climate change, They're like, Oh, the world's always changing, blah. But like in, in this sense, like it's actually true that there is no like normal and who's to say that any point in time, you know, is not going through a significant change for the animals alive at the time. But anyway, I'll talk about that a little bit more. So it's basically trying to return environments to the the way they were before humans went in there and messed them up. So it mainly involves bringing in animals that like used to live in a place and releasing them back to that place. Uh, An example are things like uh, bison. You know, there is a much more robust uh, movement in Europe for this uh, because I actually learned through this, like making this presentation for that class that uh, Europe has bison too. This was news to me and by was news. I mean, is right now. (laughs) So I had always, this is a really side tangent, but it's important to me. So I'm going to say it. I had always assumed that the reason why people out like in the United States call them Buffalo is because when Europeans got here, they were like, oh, it looks vaguely like a water buffalo, things that are actually buffalo. 
So like, oh, it looks similar to what we have back home that we call buffalo. So that's about buffalo too. But they're not. They're bison. They are different. But I was mistaken because they have them in Europe too. So that's just people. I don't know why people call them buffalo. And it really bothers me because they are different. Sorry. Anyway, people have been recently uh, breeding new populations of European bison and reintroducing them into places where they had been hunted pretty much, you know, nearly to extinction. That's happening in several countries uh, around Europe. You know, similar things with things like cows, tortoises, different kinds of antelope that have just sort of been hunted to local extinction, which is, you know, obviously different than like global extinction. It just means that like it used to live here. Now it does not, but it still lives in a different part of its range now. So that's, that's, that is rewilding. And so some people, obviously there's a lot of arguments for and against this, which we will get into, but sort of the reasons why people might want to do this are, like I said, that return to natural because hippies also like, and, and by, by what natural, by what people, okay, English, what people mean by natural is sort of reinvigorating like the nutrient and energy cycling that was in place before humans went in and killed all the large herbivores realistically uh, and doing things like preserving endangered species and preserving permafrost, which th this is how this relates to climate change is that permafrost is an exceptionally good sink for uh, greenhouse gases. They get trapped in the permafrost, and as long as that permafrost stays frosty, that those greenhouse gases stay there too. So really quickly here, if we can just make sure that we have a basic understanding, just kind of a, a ground floor. The whole idea of rewilding, without the Pleistocene kind of prefix, mm -hmm. but just rewilding is taking some sort of organism, and in this case, generally animals, that used to live in an area, used to live in an ecosystem, and generally through human cause, no longer live there, but they are not extinct. These are not, say, a woolly mammoth or something that does not exist on the planet today. They still exist somewhere, and because they still exist somewhere, you just need to essentially transport them into a new area, and all of a sudden you have them in that new area. Now, obviously, once you get them to that new area, it's a lot more complicated, and this is going to be part of what the podcast is. Mm -hmm. But that was my understanding back from your previous presentation and from you talking now about what rewilding is. Is that just kind of a good idea, a good layman's definition or th way of understanding as to what rewilding is broadly? That is the most... Um... I guess like broadly accepted thing. It's also sort of like increasing connectivity between habitats. So one of the biggest ways that humans are actually causing extinctions of things isn't by going out and hunting them, but it's by breaking up their habitat in a way that makes it so like, you know, if there's only, say we do kill all but say like, I don't know, a thousand of one animal. If there's a thousand of them, they can probably bring their population back. But because we build roads and things through their forest, or we cut down parts of their forest for trees, we split up those animals even more from that thousand that are left. So there might only be a hundred over there, 50 over here. So it's also doing things like building like natural roadways over top of roads and just like planting grass on this roadway. Uh, so that animals can like safely walk over the road from patch of forest here to patch of forest there. Um, there's also like, like lots of infrastructure type things uh, go into this as well. But the part that's talked about the most is reintroduction of animals back into their native range where they don't currently exist anymore. And that all has a number of potential benefits as well as drawbacks. And just really quickly, you already mentioned permafrost. And so uh, if we could just make sure that we all understand that what is permafrost? This is one of those things where I hear the word and like, I think I have an idea of what it is in my head. And I'm sure that it's one of those things where I'm like 40% right as to what it is in my head when I hear the word permafrost. Mm -hmm. But what is permafrost? And then once again, why is it good enough? Why is it really good to try and help combat climate change? So permafrost is... 
permanently frozen soil. So it is soil um, almost exclusively uh, in like the northern hemisphere. So you get it in like northern Canada, uh, Alaska, Russia, northern Europe. But it is it stays frozen the entire year. It does not thaw out even in the summers. So that's, that's why it's called permafrost. But why it's really good at um, sort of keeping greenhouse gases is because back before it froze, it it's, was this kind of like swampy environment. And swamps uh, are generally really good at, you know, there's a lot of plant matter there that dies and falls into the swamp, which normally would decompose and release carbon into the atmosphere. However, swamps don't really decompose things very well, which is why you hear occasionally of things like uh, swamp mummies, because swamps are very uh, anoxic. They don't have any that much oxygen in their water. And for decomposition to happen, there needs to be oxygen. So swamps are really good at preserving things. And when, you know, because it's, you know, we are still relatively, you know, in the grand scheme of things in Earth's history in a glacial period right now, uh, because it is cold enough for that, those former swamps to stay frozen in the soil. If that were to all melt, all of those greenhouse gases would go into the atmosphere. And so I'm looking at some data that I got from a paper, specifically the greenhouse gas that's mainly trapped in there is methane. So methane is about four times um, at like at minimum, I, I'm pretty sure it's actually higher than that, but it's at least four times as potent of a greenhouse gas uh, as, as carbon dioxide, you know, the kind that's normally emitted from, you know, things like driving your car or, or other ways of burning fossil fuels. So a, it's a more potent greenhouse gas. And there is currently about twice, you know, two times the carbon that's in the atmosphere is currently frozen in permafrost. Wow. That, yeah. So if we lose all of that, climate change, like, that won't even be climate change. Like areas of the planet will become unlivable if that happens. So keeping permafrost frozen is really, really important. And just really quickly here, just because this is something that I assume that some people might be thinking about when you said that permafrost is located almost exclusively in the Northern hemisphere. Correct me if I'm wrong. There's nothing particularly special about the Northern hemisphere. It's just that there is more land located in the right spots in the northern hemisphere if that land was located you know in the exact same spot but in the southern hemisphere that permafrost would you know still be in place correct right so it's it's mostly like how recently it's been frozen because like antarctica has been frozen for several million years at this point um off the top of my head i i don't know like i think like 10 to 15 plus million years i think if, if I'm remembering correctly, don't quote me on that. I'm not an Antarctica, Antarctica expert. Um, but there just wasn't the right environments for like that kind, that kind of swampiness to preserve all of that gas in Antarctica. And there's not really, other than Antarctica, there's not that much land mass close to the Southern Pole as there right, is. That's, that's kind of what I was getting at. Right. Uh, as there is in the, in the Northern Hemisphere. Um so how, how might, you know, reintroducing some of these animals, specifically like some large herbivores like, like bison, uh, like, you know, lots of other things, things like antelope, namely bison, to be honest, um, how might they help preserve the permafrost, do you think? And this is a question that I asked you during that presentation. Do you remember? Yes. And I believe I gave the exact wrong answer. <laughs> like, I, I believe if I remember correctly, the answer I gave was the exact opposite of the answer that you were looking for. And so if I'm trying to think about it again, I'm probably going to wind up giving that same answer that I gave. <laughs> but if I'm trying to think about it, it would be if we have these large herbivores that are present, they are going to be eating a lot of the kind of grass and things that grow on top, leaving everything else underneath exposed, that kind of soil exposed and making it much easier for it to you know, stay frozen and be cold. That is that is my kind of best guess. If we're talking about herbivores and we're talking about the soil, they're gonna be eating the things that are on top of the soil, making it easier for there to be, um, make it easier for that soil to stay frozen. You are partially right. Like you are, you are correct, but by the wrong mechanism. 
that's my specialty. So what we are thinking, and granted, there has not been like a good like experimental, you know, not, not a good experiment done for this yet. But I'm, I'm sure that the explanation you gave, like that wouldn't hurt, you know, but it's instead them sort of keeping snow under control. And you would think, oh, there's snow on the ground. That means the ground must be cold. Not necessarily. So what that means is that, so snow basically sort of can act like a greenhouse almost. Uh, and like there's some animals, like specifically uh, like lemmings. Most people think of lemmings. They're like, oh, they're the ones that jump off cliffs or whatever. They, they don't, but that's not what we're here to talk about. So lemmings, they instead of living on top of the snow in the winter, where it would be incredibly, incredibly cold. They live inside the snow because the snow insulates them from the colder air temperatures because snow stays at around 32 degrees. It stays at around freezing, even if the air temperature is like 10 below. So if you clear all that snow and expose the soil to that 10 below degree air, that will help keep the soil uh, colder than it would if it were covered with snow. And just for everybody, is I this is kind of how an igloo works. You know, if you've ever been inside of an igloo, it's probably going to be warmer inside because that snow that is in there is, uh, or that is making up the igloo is a pretty decent insulator and your body heat is going to help heat up some of the air that is inside that igloo. Exactly. And, you know, like I said, with the ice sort of working like a greenhouse because snow, it, like it looks white, but it's mainly clear. It's sort of white in the same way that like a polar bear's fur looks white but it's actually clear um it's just like all the different layers and tiny imperfections in it make it look white but it, it's pretty much clear and so sunlight will come down into it and get trapped just like it would in a greenhouse um so by clearing that snow it a exposes it to that colder air and b keeps the sunlight from being trapped and then increasing the temperature of the soil that way so there's very good reason to think that if we have these large herbivores and just, well, just large animals in general, you know, tromping around on the permafrost, that that would help keep it frozen longer. Less snow means the ground is going to be able to get colder because the snow is not acting as that kind of insulator or that kind of uh, greenhouse. And that is going to, that is useful for climate change. Is that the, uh, the 20 second pitch? Exactly. And for me, that's the most compelling reason. Obviously, like you want ecosystems on the rest of the rest of the world to be healthy. Uh, you know, you want them to be diverse just because more diverse ecosystems are generally more healthy so that if, you know, a disease comes through and takes out one herbivore, there's still four or five others to take its place and sort of pick up that slack from that one herbivore being down in numbers. Obviously, you want that, but the climate change aspect of it is the most compelling reason to do this, in my opinion. Uh, so since we're talking about cold stuff, let's let's now move on to what exactly is Pleistocene rewilding and how is it different? Because like I said earlier, uh, obviously the Pleistocene was a fair bit colder than it is today. So it is basically bringing back animals that were around in the Pleistocene. And I mean bring back in both senses of like, yes, de-extincting things like mammoths. And also sort of just like that transplanting of certain groups or even analogs of animals. Because there's there was quite a few different species of like camels and camel relatives in North, Amer in North America during the Pleistocene that we don't have here anymore. But there's camels in other places. So why don't we pick up those camels and push them somewhere else? Th that's that's something, you know, that would be an analog. It is not the same thing, but it's something that does the same job. And that is the whole goal of Pleistocene rewilding is to sort of recreate ecosystems that were around in the Pleistocene using sort of like the closest analog that we can find from currently living animals. And we discussed in episode three, our episode on Jurassic Park, 
de-extincting, and we had a whole discussion about that, so we don't need to, I think, go too deep into it, but just really quickly, de-extincting is where, is almost exactly what it sounds like. Animals that are literally extinct take a woolly mammoth that does not exist anywhere on the planet right now, and, you know, there are efforts to try and bring them back, and you could, if you were able to successfully bring one back, you could reintroduce it into an ecosystem. If this sounds complicated and hard, Go listen to episode You are three. correct. <laughs> yeah, you are absolutely correct. We had a whole discussion about that. And so we can move kind of right on into that more, I would say, if I had to take a guess and say more practical and probably more widely used method where we are going to take animals and push them somewhere else. Say the the Patrick Starr method versus the uh, versus the Jurassic Park method. I really enjoy that, the, the Patrick Starr method. I really wish that I had put that like in that presentation that I gave in my class. I <laughs> I really think this that is why I, you need to consult with me more often. <laughs> I did. I literally, <laughs> did, Mike. I gave this presentation to you. <laughs> well, we should have started the podcast sooner then. <laughs> um, yeah, so it is. It is much more viable for uh, a couple of reasons, mostly because some of it's already being done. Um, as with most things, Europe's pretty far ahead of us with this kind of thinking. At least by us, I mean North America. And so there's lots of projects that have been proposed and some that are already sort of being done. And I, I don't want to give North America no credit uh, in that just this past November, there was actually a, an initiative in Colorado on the ballot to reintroduce gray wolves to Colorado. Uh, it passed, thankfully. So uh, gray wolves will be reintroduced. I haven't – there's a website that, that we'll put in the show notes uh, about it who – like lobbied for this like really really extensively and uh has way more information than i could ever give you uh, about it so that'll be down the show notes but so this sort of thing is at least on some people's minds here in north america but it's definitely much more of a thing in europe uh like i said those bison you know those bison were around in the pleistocene you know perhaps not the exact same species but you know close relatives so That's being done in like over 12 countries, including countries like France. Um, Spain has has been looking into it, but mostly like Baltic type countries, you know, places like uh, Poland, uh, Ukraine. Uh, I think some of the more northern European places like Sweden uh, are looking into this kind of thing, too. There's Ukraine is actually really progressive with this, as I discovered through uh, doing like the research for for this presentation. But they also had like they, they this pretty big wildlife preserve that they like reintroduced ostriches to. Because while the species of ostrich that we have today is not like we don't have fossils from it from Europe, but we do have fossils of another species of ostri- ostrich from Ukraine. So they're like, well, why not? <laughs> so they just <laughs> picked up some African ostrich. And pushed them into this preserve in Ukraine. Now, as we're talking about this, as we're talking about sort of this normal method, the Patrick Star method of taking animals that exist in other places and pushing them to places where they used to exist or something else similar to them used to exist, something that did a similar thing used to exist. This seems like one of those things that is way more simple in your head than it would be to actually do. So in my head, in kind of the layman's head, I'm thinking you get a couple of very excited, say, you know, the equivalent of teenage animals. You bring them to somewhere (laughs) else, you know, some, you know, some sexually mature animals. You bring them somewhere else. You know, you make sure you have enough so that way there is some genetic diversity and we don't have an Alabama situation. And then you, uh, and then you kind of turn them loose and you hope that things go well. And I'm assuming that I've gotten a number of things wrong just in that description. As far as I know, that's pretty much it. <laughs> like really, it is, it is that kind of brute force simple. So ideally, you know, it's, it's tougher with birds. Birds are kind of a bad example with this. Ideally you would, you know, for example, we'll, we'll use wolves for an example because they've already done this in Yellowstone and also, I think in Michigan, they reintroduced gray wolves uh, not terribly long ago. But you can't just reintroduce like a handful of wolves from different packs. They will kill each other. So for a, a group animal like that, you would need to sort of pick up an entire pack and move it. And so they might be a little disoriented at the beginning as they try to like learn their new territory. But 
as long as there is food for them to eat and like shelter for them, they'll do pretty much fine. Uh, as long as it's in a place where they once lived, which, you know, in the case of Colorado and Michigan, that is where gray wolves have historically lived with ostriches. It's a little trickier, you know, and, and I would say with most mammals, I would say you can probably just like tranquilize them artificially and inseminate like a, a handful of females as well as put them out there with males, just so the females are already pregnant when you put them out there. Ostriches are a little tougher with that because obviously like bird, like fertilization reproduction works differently than it does in mammals. Um, they, birds generally lay eggs very quickly after they are, uh, after they mate. So ostriches are a little tricky. Mammals much more straightforward. You just make sure the animals are healthy and you do things like putting like uh, tags on them or like um, RFID chips, GPS things, things like that. So you can microchip them like uh, Bill Gates. And <laughs> so you, so you can track them and you basically just sort of watch them, make sure that they stay healthy, make sure that they're getting enough food, make sure that they can live in the environment. Ideally you do these kinds of things before you release a couple dozen animals, but <laughs> it, it really is just kind of that straightforward as long as, you know, you have a way to make them stay in the spot you want them to stay. That is, uh, I guess it's somewhat comforting that, you know, the layman's idea is what is correct, but also it's, uh, it's kind of amazing that something can be, you know, mostly that straightforward. Obviously, you know, there are going to be some technical quirks in any, in any version of what it is you're doing. The, the devil's always in the details, but the broad basics are kind of what you would expect. Yeah. And obviously, you know, I'm not a conservation biologist and I'm sure if, if any are listening, they're probably screaming at me that I got something wrong, rightfully so. I'm not an expert in this by any means. So I'm sure that it is more complicated than I'm making it seem, but it's probably more straightforward than people might think. And on, on top of that, it's it's not just, so we, I sort of, I'm looking at our, our notes here. There is one really specific thing that's sort of like halfway between de-extincting and halfway between picking them up and pushing them somewhere else. And that's something that has been called the Tauros program that's being done in Europe. So the modern domesticated animals that we have are not the same species that we domesticated them from. They are like morphologically different and are different species. Typically those species that we domesticated them from are no longer around. So with cows, they used to be called something called oryx. And, uh, you know, oryx are no longer around. But there is, in, the, in this Tauros program, they're sort of selectively breeding, you know, domesticated cattle to look more like them. Because, you know, we have pictures of these things. That's how recently they were around. We have pictures, really highly detailed drawings of them. So we're basically selectively breeding them to be a like more wild temperament, longer fur, uh, you know, bigger horns, things like that to then eventually release into the wild to be with their bison cousins and, and all the other wild things. So that's sort of the closest thing to de-extinction that I think is like feasible, but just want to throw that out there as well. This kind of sounds like what smart people do with agriculture. You know, you can, you can look at uh, old corn and it looks nothing like it is now, but you selectively breed you know, whatever kind of plant you want to have, whether it's a bigger flower or produce a higher yield of, you know, an edible part or whatever it is. And, you know, eventually you do that over a long enough period of time and you wind up getting something that is at least functionally different, even if you were starting with the same place. Exactly. Like we've been selectively breeding things for like tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years. So... That, like now we actually just have like a goal in mind. So right, doing it more purposefully now. We kind of know the we know the why instead of just the what. Exactly. So those are some of the proposals in Europe, and most of them have not been going on long enough for any real like results, you know, to come back from these sort of experiments. Uh, so. You know, we'll check back in a decade or so <laughs> uh, on, you know, how well this is actually doing. But so now let's talk about some 
proposed North American things that are a little less feasible than just selectively breeding some cows. So obviously, mammoths, we already talked about this. That is mostly a thing, like, the, the DNA from mammoths that we do have is from, usually from Siberia. But I, I feel like most of the people trying to, like, bring back mammoths are North American. Again, haven't looked super, super far into it. Don't know that for sure. But I just feel like that's a very American thing to do. Is like, oh, <laughs> why, why try to work real hard at it when we can just think something up and make some mutant demon creature? Sure, that seems very American. We're moving on. Agreed. Camels, like I mentioned earlier. Camels used to be very, very prominent in North American ecosystems. And there is even actually a little bit of a precedent. And I remember Mike having a good laugh when I mentioned this in that presentation. I think I know where you're going here. There was, for a time, some camels living in uh, sort of the desert southwest of uh, the United States as part of the United States Camel Corps. (laughs) <laughs> which was a re- a real thing just just barely pre-civil war uh as we were still sort of pushing westward uh instead of using horses to move across you know Arizona, New Mexico into southern California uh they used camels instead and some of them uh either got loose or i think some of the troops got called back for the civil war so i think they just kind of left the camels and they were doing fine you know they were eating the plants they were doing fine uh because why wouldn't they they're they're camels um (laughs) and most people think of the typical like desert camels that you see in all the like super stereotypical pictures of like egypt but there's actually lots of different species of camels that have like pretty thick fur that would do pretty fine in like canada and even you know out here on the great plains you know so And as I was saying before, the more diverse an ecosystem is, generally the better. Just because if one thing takes a hit, you know, there's less of a chance of the entire ecosystem collapsing. You need to, it's better to have more points of failure instead of having, you know, it's better to have a a food web, as I would have learned in fourth or fifth grade, than a food chain because there are more things that, it's way harder to destroy the whole thing if there's multiple ways of that things are interconnected exactly and so if you've kind of noticed most of the animals that we've talked about so far are things that eat plants for an obvious reason in that we don't want to put out things into the wild that can eat us i think that makes sense but obviously you can't just throw a bunch of bison you know a bunch of extra bison or a bunch of camels out into an ecosystem without things to eat them. So along with these programs of, you know, people proposing to release, you know, more bison, you know, out into the great plains, release camels to the great plains. There are also people who are like, okay, what about lions? Because there was a species of, there was an American lion that was a a fair bit larger actually than uh, African lions that we have today, you know, well-documented and you know, you know, Native Americans likely interacted with them when they were first coming, uh, you know, from Asia, you know, through Alaska, down through Canada. Those lions were still here. So not all that long ago, we had lions living in North America. One proposal. Also, cheetahs. Uh, not closely related to modern cheetahs, but functionally the same. In fact, there's actually... Uh, an animal here on the Great Plains that is the fastest land animal uh, on the planet, or at least significantly faster than anything else that is around. I don't think they're faster than cheetahs, but they are way, way faster than wolves or mountain lions, which would be the main predators today. And they're the pronghorn antelope. And so one big hypothesis for a while was that, okay, there must have been some kind of North American cheetah to be chasing these things for them to need to be this fast. And then, you know, not all that long after, we actually found fossils of it, which was which is super cool. So 
releasing things like lions and cheetahs out to the Great Plains to eat these newly introduced new herbivores. Any thoughts, Mike? Would you would would you like to have some lions or cheetahs running around your neighborhood? You know, I can imagine, and there's a section here on our notes, or in our bullet points here, where like, why haven't we done this yet? I'm imagining <laughs> that the you know kind of the Murphy's law and chaos theory of all of this is going to lead to some really massive pushback on all of this because, like you said, it's you know it's not a great idea to just start reintroducing a whole bunch of new herbivores into an area without also, you know, something to eat them, you, you know, I assume, at least in most cases. And yet when you're introducing carnivores into an ecosystem that may not have already been there and likely has humans somewhere nearby, one thing, um, I was reading something, um, about something completely unrelated recently. And one thing I read was, you know, no matter where you go at this point, Humans are not, civilization is never that far away that, yeah. at the end of the day. And so when you start introducing, when we start talking about reintroducing things like lions and tigers and things that here in North America, we just don't associate. And bears. Oh my. Right. You know what? I can't <laughs> believe I, uh, I left that. How did out. you miss that? You know what? I was, I was so deep in thought and trying to get my words out in the appropriate way that I missed the very obvious, <laughs> the, the very obvious thing there. And that is why we are a great team. But when you have, when you're reintroducing all of this, I can imagine that's where you're going to get quite a bit of pushback from the, the policymakers and the people that are living in these areas. And as well as the scientists themselves, who, while I'm sure they care about the well-being of all these animals and these ecosystems would also like to, you know, be alive. Yeah, that is one of many, many concerns. Like, you know, the, the politics of it are terrible. You know, that uh, there's all sorts of articles written since that wolf legislation passed in Colorado this past November. And... You know, of people like going out and interviewing people like ranchers and they're like, I'm going to have to switch to a new career after ranching for, you know, 30 years, because if there's a pack of wolves that comes and eats my cows, what am I going to do? Because they're going to be protected. I can't shoot them. And so there, there's definitely a, a huge, huge, huge cost benefit analysis that needs to go on. And that's just wolves. That's not a lion. You know, wolves generally will not attack a person unless they are, like, absolutely desperate. But a, a lion 100% will. Like, that, there's not a quite... I feel like nobody would question that. So there, there needs to be a really thorough cost-benefit analysis that actually some people have done for reintroducing certain species into the Great Plains. And I don't have it in front of me, but off the top of my head... I think like the lowest cost to, cost to the highest benefit were tortoises. Something about that seems reasonable, even though I don't know why. So tortoises um, are very, very good at nutrient cycling. They eat lots and lots of plants, especially uh, specifically the African sulcata tortoise. Um, they eat basically hay and they're not all that great at digesting it. So they poop out a bunch of still really nutritious you know, nutritious poop. If you're soil, you love that nutritious poop. And it's just really good at, you know, nutrient cycling. But at the same time, you know, lions are also really good at nutrient cycling, but a tortoise isn't going to kill you and your family. <laughs> so <laughs> really high benefit, really low cost. And some people have proposed, you know, releasing a population of tortoises into like the desert Southwest to sort of slow down like desertification and, you know, promote more like grassland savanna type ecosystems and preventing the spread of deserts, which will eventually happen as the climate gets hotter from climate change. So that's, that's an option. Obviously the highest cost to reintroducing things would be things like if people went this Avenue mammoths, uh, or potentially, I've seen people also being like, why don't we just drop some African elephants out there? We don't need mammoths. We have elephants. They did basically the same thing. And like, ecologically, yeah. But 
at the same time, at least if you're in your house, a lion won't get you. Whereas an elephant can destroy your house. <laughs> right, an ele- right. An elephant, you know, trips on a mouse or something and then all of a sudden, you know, boom. Yeah. So super high cost, exceptionally high reward. Elephants, like ecologically, elephants are one of the most, like other than humans, undoubtedly, elephants change their ecosystem the most. You really? know, because elephants basically create uh, like grassland ecosystems where they go because they rip up trees. They literally will just rip trees out of the ground. Or Jeez. like, or, you know, maybe not even intentionally, like, like they'll just like rub up against it and, you know, accidentally knock over a tree because they're elephants and they're just really good at promoting grassland ecosystems. And again, because they're, um, you know, their digestive system's not all that efficient. So they eat lots and lots of grass and then poop out that nutritious poop, just like tortoises do, but obviously in much higher quantities which means more nutrients are available to that soil and speeds up nutrient cycling, which is really good for keeping environments healthy. But again, a tortoise isn't going to destroy your house. So there's huge, huge cost benefits analysis analyses that need to go on. And also just sort of reimagining, you know, it's not like people are just advocating for just throwing them out there and letting them do what they do. You know, Some people have been like, why don't we just really encourage, you know, ranchers to diversify the livestock that they have and be less involved with managing them? So it's like instead of just ranching these one species of cow, why don't we encourage and maybe even provide like tax write offs if you add some different kinds of camels to your ranch that you can you know, shear and sell the, the fur off of like people do with like alpacas because alpacas technically are, are in the same family as camels close enough. And, you know, why not? Again, that's more, just more animals out in the ecosystem and also setting up some kind of like preserves and promoting like ecotourism, which is very, very big in places You know, like I've personally done ecotourism. I went to Central America for about a week and we did some like science things as well. But we also did some ecotourism type stuff and it is wildly popular. So that could really bring some economic revenue into places where there might not currently be a lot of tourism. So there's a couple of things that immediately hit me from what you were just talking about. Number one, the the why not do things is I can imagine the the switching costs of all of that and just getting people on board. It's one thing to say, we're going to have a tax write-off. It's quite another thing to say, you know, how you make your living, your livelihood is now going to, we are at least going to encourage, if not, you know, somehow force you to change what you're doing, what your family has been doing for quite, you know, quite a long time, possibly for generations. And so I can imagine just that kind of pushback from people that even if it might be in their best interest on paper, to just want to kind of pump the brake on that. The second thing that you bring up, kind of the ecotourism, my first, the place my brain first goes to when I hear ecotourism, seeing, you know, kind of seeing animals that aren't normally around here is the Tiger King. And that, and I'm imagining that's, that's that fair. is, that's fair. I'm imagining that is uh, number one, an example of some form of ecotourism gone wrong and also a really good kind of point in the column of if you're going to do this we can't just have joe exotic which is the name i probably would have made (laughs) up for the fictional person who to do this had i not actually seen the tiger king but you don't just want some dude running a zoo in charge of all this but you want to kind of go all in you want to say okay we're going to get some smart people. We are going to do this appropriately. We are going to make sure that we are not doing this, you know, halfway. We are going to actually make sure we do this correctly. So, but but here's the thing with that. Like 100% agree, but we already sort of did that in arguably the most popular ecotourism spot in the continental United States, Yellowstone. We reintroduced wolves there. 
And granted, you know, I spent about four days in Yellowstone uh, last year, and I didn't see any wolves. I would have liked to, but I didn't. But those wolf populations are managed to the extent that, you know, the National Park Service allows. And I would think that we would just sort of incorporate this kind of ecotourism type place into there's all sorts of federal land in the Western United States that is kind of just not being used for anything. It is federal land. Maybe they're leasing it out to different like, you know, resource extraction companies, mining companies, things like that, which like inherently sounds kind of bad if you were from like the East coast in a place where there's not a ton of mining, but that's how most, you know, there's at least like exploration sort of being done on a lot of federal lands, but it's like, if you introduce, you know, this ecotourism to those lands with this protected population of lions, who knows, you know? And that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Like if there's, I'm, you know, obviously unfamiliar with the Yellowstone wolf program, but if there's precedent for doing this correctly, then I am all for doing it correctly and making sure that it is done in a responsible, humane way that is going to get, you know, at least hopefully the desired outcome 80 or 90% of the time. I imagine the, the, the failure rate on these kinds of projects is, you know, is something to take note of. But if you are kind of hitting the mark a reasonable percentage of the time and doing it in a methodical, smart way with a whole bunch of land in the Western United States where there's just not a whole lot of people living, then absolutely, you know, let's do it and let's go all in. Yeah, for sure. Um, so speaking of trying to do this, let's talk about a couple case studies. Yeah, let's go rapid fire here. We're kind of approaching a, uh, yeah. a full hour. So let's go a couple. Let's do some rapid fire on some places has already done some actual things that have already happened. So there is a place in northeastern Siberia called, and you will not believe this, Pleistocene Park. <laughs> so Did this come before or after Jurassic Park? Before. Wow. All right. So it was established in 1988. So a little before the book was written. Uh, I would imagine that Michael Crichton was in the process of writing the book. So I'm not saying that Michael Crichton might have gotten the idea for the name from uh, this, but I'm not going to rule it out. Um, And basically, it is just a preserve sort of naturally, you know, run and owned by this one scientist guy who's just kind of like a pet project of his. Um, Jeez. Yeah. So he. okay, I, I you say that, but it sounds it sounds worse than it is because it is way smaller than you think it is. But anyway, he's sort of testing a couple of hypotheses. One, there's sort of argument about whether all of these giant animals from the Pleistocene uh, going extinct was the fault of climate change versus humans overhunting them. That's pretty up in the air. We're pretty sure that it's kind of both, but that's one of his hypotheses. Not really sure. His methodology for that doesn't seem very good. But the more exciting thing that he's testing is that protection of permafrost. Obviously, as I've said, very exciting to me. So it does have its issues, obviously. The first one being that it's way smaller than you think it is. Uh, Currently, it is only 20 square kilometers, which is roughly eight square miles. Jeez. So it seems like you're pretty limited in like in what you can do. And like there is definitely an asterisk on that. Um, Let me let me find it. So it is it started off as only about a. 125 acre property, but it's slowly getting bigger. Um, There is plans to expand it. Uh, So it's basically, there's like the center area that is mainly being focused on. And then like a really big buffer zone of a couple hundred square miles pending results of how effective it has, it has been uh, so far. The park will be expanded to include those, uh, you know, several hundred uh, extra square miles. But basically they're sort of, trying to see if they can pick up some species and put them here and to see if they can, in fact, replicate those uh, extinct ecosystems that don't live there anymore. So, And when you say bring them here, just really quickly, you might have already said this, but where is this park located? This is in uh, northeastern Siberia. So the very northern part of Russia. Basically Hoth from Star Wars. So... (laughs) 
and that's a little bit of an exaggeration. There's not that much snow. It's mostly like tundra y, where there's not a lot of snow, just like grassy permafrost areas. So they're basically reintroducing animals such as uh, Siberian tigers, which did not currently live there. And then there's a whole list, you know, there's it has its own Wikipedia page if you feel so inclined. I'm sure it will be in the show notes. But preliminary pre- preliminary results look kind of promising. You know, it looks like the permafrost has been melting a little slower, but that part of the experiment has not been going on for all that long. So uh, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. I'm looking forward to doing the retrospective on this on our podcast <laughs> a decade from now. Um, so that's probably the most talked about uh, sort of case study of Pleistocene rewilding. One of the much better and more viable options, in my opinion, is uh, our next case study, which is, and I know I'm not going to pronounce this right, but Makawai, Makawahi Cave Preserve in Hawaii. I'm going to so, give you a B plus on that one. Thank you. I crave your approval. <laughs> so it is sort of a private preserve owned by uh, a, a biologist, and uh, it has a cave in it with some fossils, which is kind of weird because Hawaii is not known for its fossils, but they're very recent fossils. Um, and notable of these fossils are some fossils of extinct flightless geese. Um, you know, that, like I mentioned in, uh, you know, the uh, vertebrates episode, sometimes birds just get blown to an island and then they're like, hey, there's nothing on the ground that's going to eat me. I'm going to be on the ground now and stop flying. So these geese, from what we can tell, because we have fossil poops, of theirs, we can tell that they ate mostly grass. And so by analyzing their poop, their fossil poop, we can tell that their diet is really similar to uh, that of that African sulcata tortoise that I was talking about earlier. So what this scientist has done is fenced off an area, and these are really quite big tortoises. So like by fenced off, I mean like put giant wooden stakes in the ground so they didn't just like, you know, plow through the fence. So, but, but to wall off these, you know, tortoises that he basically is rescuing because they're somewhat frequently kept as pets, but they get bigger than people think they will. So he's taken in and rescued some of these tortoises and just kind of let them do their thing. And again, preliminary results. And he actually has a Ted talk about it too, but he, has noticed that they, the tortoises help keep down on invasive plants and actually help promote, you know, the native plant diversity in Hawaii, which like most things on islands these days is, you know, pretty close to extinction. And so I think that this is a much, much more viable path. The sort of like surrogacy is what this is called, you know, introducing a surrogate, a, an analog to an environment that does a similar thing, but is not the same thing. And, you know, it might not even be an animal that's closely related, you know, such as like a big, big old flightless goose and a tortoise, not closely related, but did functionally similar things in their environments. And I feel like finding analogs like that to, to reintroduce to these environments is way more of a viable position than something like bringing back mammoths. For a lot of different reasons, it seems like it's more viable. It also seems like it'd be an an interesting case study. Like, okay, just how, if you have something that does all the same things on paper, just how similar can we get that ecosystem if we kind of make that one-for-one trade? Yeah, exactly. I I like that a lot. Cool. So is there anything else that we need to uh, kind of close with when it comes to Pleistocene rewilding and the the efforts that are underway. I definitely like this concept, and I like the fact that there are smart people that are going through the the necessary processes on all of this. Not really. Uh, I just think it's something a really interesting piece of you know combining paleontology with you know like modern conservation that I think is is really neat. Um, obviously, lots and lots of problems, but I'm really excited to see where it goes in the future. I couldn't agree more. I'm definitely excited to hopefully as these kinds of things progress, maybe do more episodes in the future and see the way different things end up coming out of this. 
So I think that has been our political episode, <laughs> which, uh, you know, uh, possibly a little bit light on the politics. However, the, uh, the science was pretty good. And depending on where you live, this actually may be a rather salient political issue now or rather soon in the future. So my name is Mike. That is Gavin. This has been episode seven of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. Gavin, I'll see you next Absolutely, week. Absolutely, Mike. See you then.